Once upon a time, there was Pixar, and they were making movies. Actually, they made one movie, and then they decided to make more. Their next movie would be A Bug's Life, which is about bugs. But within that studio, there was also this guy called Jeffrey Katzenberg, and he was real mad, and he left the studio and decided to make his own, which would also make movies, and their movie would be called Ants, and it would also be about bugs. At this point, the whole thing just became a competition to see who could release their bug movie first. That was the whole thing that happened. 1998 was a big year for movie rivalries. It's hard not to get sucked into the affair. Did Katzenberg steal the idea for a bug movie as an act of petty revenge, or did he come up with it first? Which studio came out victorious? The general public will never fully understand the true dimension of the whole operation, and our best shot at guessing what went down lies in the movies themselves. Does this conflict end up reflected in the films? Do they feel like a rush job, or do they turn out okay? And most importantly, which movie is better? It's a bug's life. It's definitely a bug's life. Whenever people talk about this feud, they tend to generalize the movies in order to make them look more like copies. After all, they both focus on the story of an ant who is a little bit of an oddball and tries to win the heart of a princess with his antics, while also working on a plan to save his colony. And for the longest time, I thought that description was fully accurate. But when I actually sat down to look at both movies side by side, I realized that even though they both started from the same place, they ran their premises into two completely different directions. In this video, I wish to explore the themes of each bug movie, understanding their similarities and analyzing their differences. How many lessons can we learn from a bunch of intrepid ants? I guess we're about to find out. I wanna talk about ant movies. I want to start off this discussion by saying that my analysis is focused on the story of both movies, and how each tale deals with the details of their premise. I am not here to compare things like the animation or the voice acting, though I might comment on that when I think it's necessary. Both movies have their strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the visuals, and I think the actors give a good performance in both cases. As for the stories themselves, I do not fault them for having similarities. After all, if you are going to make a film about ants, there are certain ideas your mind gravitates towards, simply because of the very nature of those insects. The anthill setting, as well as the presence of a queen, feel like very logical choices. Ants being defined by their multitudes creates an interesting scenario to discuss questions of identity and the role of the individual in a larger group. And if you're gonna talk about ants, you might as well add some other bugs into the mix. This isn't enough proof to say that one story is definitely copying the other, and that's also where the similarities kind of end. Let's start off by looking at a bug's life. It's almost cheating for me to talk about this movie, because I obviously have a huge bias towards it. I had the VHS tape as a kid, I watched it a hundred times, and it just has a special place in my heart. The discourse surrounding this movie has taken a bit of a turn in the years after its release, with many of its viewers giving it the title of a leftist masterpiece, or attempting to make a Marxist reading of the story. And for the most part, I agree with it. And it feels like the movie could really support that narrative. There's a group of ants who live on a tiny island, and every year they collect food for the winter. But a huge portion of that food must be given to the grasshoppers that terrorize them. The grasshoppers claim that this is the natural cycle of life, and that they're really doing the ants a favor. If they weren't there to quote-unquote protect the ants, a lot of bigger bugs would try to take advantage of them. You also have an ant named Flick, who struggles to fit in. He has outlandish ideas to modernize his colony, but they end up causing more trouble than they're worth. When his latest invention backfires and causes the ants to lose the food they have collected, Flick is banished from the colony until he can find a group of insects strong enough to defeat the grasshoppers. You know that thing I said earlier about how your mind automatically turns to certain aspects when thinking of ants? The idea of labor is also one of them. 
it's easy to see the ant as the figure of the restless worker. And here, a bug's life turns into a tale about the exploitation of labor. The ants are the ones picking the food, but the grasshoppers feel entitled to the fruits of their efforts. The grasshoppers did nothing to deserve that reward. They didn't work for it, they didn't help the ants in any way, and the protection they claim to provide is just a manipulation tactic to keep the ants scared. While the grasshoppers say that there are bugs out there who wouldn't hesitate to terrorize the ants, they are the ones who are actually doing it. Even though the ants do all the work, the grasshoppers take all the profits. Flick finds help in the form of a gang of circus bugs, which he mistakes for warriors, and they also mistake Flick for a talent scout. When the performers find out about the truth, they try to leave, but they end up becoming fond of the colony and of the admiration that the ants feel for them, because their skills had never been valued before. Here, a bond is formed out of appreciation for a craft, even if it is initially misguided. Flick and the circus bugs come up with a plan to scare away the grasshoppers by building a fake bird. At first, it seems to be working, but then the bird falls apart and the grasshoppers double down on their threats. That's when Flick realizes that the one thing capable of defeating their bullies is the very ant community that thrives on the island. And once the ants come to that same conclusion, they team up and chase the grasshoppers away. Their initial plan was to rely on the grasshopper's fear of an external threat. The only thing that could scare off their oppressors was an even bigger, meaner creature, even if it was just the illusion of one. When that plan fails, the true answer emerges. The ants have always held the power because their strength comes from their numbers. But they are only truly unstoppable when they work in harmony. I really like the scene where the ants stand up to the grasshoppers, mostly because Flick has this whole speech about how powerful and cool the ants are when they stick together, and you feel like he's kind of making it up as he goes along. He really is just coming to that conclusion, much like the rest of his colony. And there's this moment where he realizes that the grasshoppers knew about that all along. And you know it, don't you? And they really did, because this idea had been directly referenced in an earlier scene. The grasshoppers exploited the ants because it was an easy way of getting food without doing any labor. And they did it through violence and fear because they knew that the ants were more powerful than they were. The greatest threat to their scheme would be if the ants realized the power they held. So the grasshoppers did everything they could to make the ants feel insignificant. So yeah, the workers are entitled to all of the profits of their labor and they shouldn't have to give them away just because some other guy said so. Their strength lies in their numbers and in the power of their community. It's not a very complicated story, and I mean this in the best way possible. There isn't a lot of grey morality involved, the grasshoppers are clearly in the wrong and the ants were right to stand up and reclaim their freedom. I watched too much of A Bug's Life as a kid and I grew up to be a dirty little leftist. Ants, on the other hand... Okay, so I had a VHS tape for A Bug's Life and I had always been aware of the Ants movie as a concept, but I never really sat down to watch it. My parents claimed that this was the first movie I saw in theaters, but I had no say in it because I was literally two years old at the time. As a kid, I remember channel surfing one day and catching a bit of the movie, but it was that one scene where the main ant talks to the decapitated head of another ant who was brutally mangled in the battlefield, and I can't say that left a good impression. This, coupled with me finding out years later about who voices the main ant, made me conclude that I would never watch ants in my life. Anyway, I watched Ants now. Here's DreamWorks' rival bug movie, Ants. With a Z. Because it's the 90s. Our protagonist is an ant named Z, and he's bummed out because his life makes him feel insignificant. His colony pushes an idea that you must always put the group before yourself, and that you must be constantly working for the betterment of society. In this world, your life is determined from the moment you are born, and there is nothing you can do to change that path. 
All other ants seem to be okay with it, and Z's friends even seem to find pleasure in that lifestyle, making Z feel like even more of an outcast. Z is desperate to find anything that can give him a sense of identity and importance. At first, this comes in the form of Princess Bala. The two meet in an ant bar and Z thinks that they are destined for romance, even if Bala made it pretty clear that it was a one-time thing. In trying to see her again, he ends up switching places with a soldier, but this backfires when he is drafted into combat. As the only survivor of the battle against termites, Z finds a bit of comfort in the glory of being a war hero, but that too is short-lived. Through a small series of hijinks, he is expelled from the colony through a trash chute and decides to search for Insectopia, this ideal place where bugs can be free. Z can be seen as the opposite of Flick. The protagonist of a bug's life desperately wants to fit in, but he tries too hard and is shunned by the others. When he leaves, he does everything he can to come back. Meanwhile, Z does not want to belong to his colony. He doesn't try particularly hard to fit in either, and even though he is surrounded by a supportive community, he abandons them the first chance he gets. Z believes that being a part of a colony means surrendering his individual identity. None of the other ants seem to mind that, and some even seem to be thriving. But the movie wants us to side with Z, so we're supposed to believe that the rest of the ants have been brainwashed through propaganda, and that this kind of life is actually undesirable. While A Bug's Life proposes that community is a good thing because it grants you power and freedom, Ants argues that communities are bad because they leave you trapped and powerless. Z eventually finds Insectopia, but he has to go back to his ant hill to save the princess. And then he discovers this evil plan by an ant general to wipe out what he believes is the weak side of the population. Z realizes that the only way of escaping the general's trap is to work together, something that he had great trouble doing before. And the movie ends on an optimistic note. After this whole thing, the ants supposedly rebuilt their colony under a less strict lifestyle, where the ants are able to choose their paths more easily. You know, I finally feel like I found my place. And you know what? It's right back where I started. But the difference is, this time, I chose it. Both movies are, in one way or another, a product of their times. This can clearly be seen through the CGI. I mean, those bugs cannot blink and sink, and those legs are not attached to a body. But also, the 90s were very much about sticking it to the man, and boy, there were a lot of movies about losing your identity in a mindless work environment. Ants is very much about that. I mean, there are other aspects to the story, but this is definitely a theme here. And it's also related to how each movie deals with the concept of labor. In A Bug's Life, labor is used for the benefit of others. The real issue is making sure that this benefit is being enjoyed by those who are actually entitled to it. In the case of ants, labor is excessive, mind-numbing, and oftentimes used for the wrong purposes. The digging ants were being told to build a tunnel that would eventually lead them to their own demise, a fact which was deliberately hidden from them. Flick was very in tune with the message of his colony. Everything he did was for the benefit of his entire society. He wanted to build machines that would make picking grain easier, allowing them to gather more food in less time. While they were under the control of the grasshoppers, those extra hours could be used to store more food for themselves. And when they broke free of their exploitation, the time could be spent on art and leisure. The colony itself, however, was against Flick's inventions. The ants were very keen on tradition, and Flick's ideas often ended in disaster. It wasn't out of malice, mind you, he really just needed some time and support to adjust them. But they were still challenging the way things are done and were therefore seen as dangerous. The only way the ants could break free of the grasshopper's grasp was by trusting innovation and creativity. The ants know that building a giant bird goes against their usual way of life, but it's gotten to a point where their lifestyle is no longer viable, and they realize it's time for a change. 
Flick is, in a way, a very kind version of a 90s hero. A misfit who challenges tradition, but who does so in order to help his peers build a stronger community, fighting for their rights as a collective. Z, on the other hand, can't stand the same group-based mindset he's been fed all his life. He believes individual choice should be more important than the needs of the many. In a way, work feels alienating. Instead of driving the community closer, Z feels isolated by it. The only way of breaking out of this confinement is by standing out, which Z tries to do to various degrees. Z couldn't bear performing massive group tasks because of his lack of belonging but also because he didn't find purpose in it. When he convinces the colony to work together so that they can escape the tunnel floods, this is the closest that Ants ever gets to the message of a bug's life. In this case, instead of working towards an empty or even harmful goal that will only benefit an external group, the Ants have to join forces to save their colony, which would otherwise be completely doomed. Still, not even that moment is enough to convince Z of the true power of teamwork. As soon as he escapes to the surface, he begins his monologue about how his actions reform society, and how everything is better now because he gets to choose his own destiny. The world presented in a bug's life can be easily connected to an idea of capitalism. The ants are a representation of the workforce, who is being controlled by a dominant social class that takes all of the profits. That's also where the connection kind of ends, because that's all they needed to say. You don't gotta look into, like, the stock market economy of Bug City. It's a simple message for a simple movie. Ants is not as simple, and it's a bit harder to boil their ideas down into straightforward connections like that. There's a criticism of a highly militarized society, and the figure of a general who wants to eliminate the weak is an echo of radical dictatorships. The propaganda-based, work-heavy, freedomless society sounds a lot like what America imagines socialist countries to be like, with Insectopia standing in as the ideal free market paradise those poor ants wish to escape to. Even as I'm drawing these connections, I am not attempting to reduce the images in this movie to a single clear-cut allegory. Ants is a more complex story, and that fact doesn't automatically make it better or worse than its competitor. But because of this complexity, reducing the colony in Ants to a critique on capitalism feels like a very shallow reading. So when the movie itself tries to throw around sentences like It's the workers who control the means of production. It feels very empty and out of place, because that doesn't seem to be the point of the movie. The issue here isn't that the worker ants don't own the means of production, their profits aren't being stolen by a superior class and they can all enjoy the benefits of their labor. Z's idea of a perfect society draws a lot of inspiration from capitalism. If you look at capitalism from the perspective of a supposed freedom of choice. He wants to build a world where he can do whatever he wants, putting himself before the group. His idea of paradise is the industrialized, individualistic, labor-free world of Insectopia, on which the movie doesn't spend enough time for it to be criticized. That outcome really rubs me the wrong way. But I will admit, even though the moral of a bug's life speaks louder to me, it kind of took the easy way out. It presented a society where, despite a few minor disagreements, everyone was happy belonging to it. Even the biggest outcast wants nothing more but to be welcomed and to make everyone's lives better. The movie never dares to question what would happen to an ant who wasn't satisfied with colony life. The world of ants had its share of external threats, like the termites, but also a good amount of social instability, like an ever-growing military conspiring to take the throne and the idea of unhappy citizens. Balancing all of those issues into the same story is an inherently tougher job. 
and I believe the movie does put in the necessary effort. It's just that the answer they find to all of those matters is another individualistic, highly American approach. So what's the deal here? Why am I even bothering to compare these movies? Well, firstly, because the studios behind those films declared war on one another. It's extremely petty and very entertaining to watch from afar. From that lens, it's hard not to think of the movies in comparative terms, even if they are both capable of standing their own ground and focus on different styles of writing and humor. But the way I see it, the Ants vs. A Bug's Life debate is a fascinating example on how the same setting and inspiration can be used to explore completely different ideas. Ants presents us with a society that is so focused on the greater collective good that it threatens individuality, making you lose your sense of self. Work is used as a tool to keep you isolated, even within a crowd, and it is often in the service of the wrong purposes. In that sense, you must try to find a better balance between the group and the individual, and strive to build a world where you have a greater grasp at personal freedom. A Bug's Life explores a world where its real strength lies in the communities we form and the bonds we cultivate, where you should stand up for your rights and defend the well-being of those around you. Labor is rewarding and strengthens your connections, and when paired with well-meaning innovation, it can bring positive and constructive change. Each movie is an interpretation of issues that plague human society, and each presents us not only with different questions, but different solutions as well. I'm sure there are people out there who identify with each of those narratives, as well as people who watch these movies and came up with readings that are completely different from mine. Even if I am much more in tune with The Bug's Life, that doesn't eliminate the merits of Ants, and the same would be true even if I preferred the DreamWorks movie. Regardless of which film speaks louder to you, it's nice to see how many lessons can be sparked from the same basic idea. And when it comes to ant movies, those stories are not at all insignificant. Thank you for watching. Well, hello there. It was very nice of you to watch this video. Special thanks to my beautiful patrons for making videos like these possible. You guys are putting the ant in excellent, even if that's not how you spell it. If you would like to join the gang, click the link in the description. If you have enjoyed the video, you can also help me out by clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell too. You can also follow me on Twitter and share this video with your friends. Feel free to leave a comment down below, especially if it is about how much you love a bug's life, ants, or both. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on my next video. Bye! Was I literally the only kid who didn't burn ants with a magnifying glass?